Yo. What's good, fam? Ain't shit. I'm chilling. Everything good. I can't complain. I feel you. I feel you, man. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, the man of the hour has finally tapped in with us, Rob Markman. Love, love. What's up, man? What's up, everybody? What's up, man? Artist, journalist, curator of a whole lot of dope shit. Yeah, man. You know, I'm just trying to make the most of my time. I figure just kind of live out every one of these dreams before they call my number. You know what I'm saying? That's all. Oh, yeah. We're going to get to all of that. All these dreams you got going, man. Um, So, like, you have, like, like you're a real hip-hop head. You're a real hip-hop head. Um, artist, journalist from Flatbush, Brooklyn. Facts. Already. And, and um, you're head of artist relations for uh, Genius, right? Shit. I used to be. Now they, they made me the VP over there. So, oh. yeah, I'm VP of content strategy over at Genius now. So, okay. you know what Congratulations, I mean? brother. Yeah, man. So that 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 was love. That happened earlier this year mm -hmm. before COVID and all that stuff. But but ultimately, man, all that mean like titles are semantics and they are important and how we're represented in the world and, and to see people like us in these positions. But at the end of the day, it's just man, we just doing whatever needs to be done. You know what I'm saying? And and, and being the team player and, and, and playing that role. Yeah, I feel I feel you, man. So like when you talk about doing what needs to be done, are you speaking more so of not only just the brand, but also just for the culture as well? Yeah. I, I mean, well, one, definitely for the brand and, 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 you know, cause that's my job. Honestly, that's, that's what <laughs> food on the table keeps lights on. It keeps clothes on my kids back. Mm. Um, but for the culture as well, man, I, you know, I think one thing in a professional setting, like in these office yeah. jobs, I, I've worked at double XL before that, I worked at MTV for a number of years before that and never once. And I, I started really at the beginning and built my way up. Never once have I ever told somebody, yo, that's not my job. Mm, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I've always just approached it like that. Like, yo, whatever needs to be done, if, if it's in baseball, if you need me to pinch hit, then it's pinch hit. If you need me to pinch run, then it's pinch running. Like, you know, it's all of that. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the culture, you know, kind of the same things apply a little bit. I, you know, it's just like an ego thing. It's like you don't put yourself above the team. Right. And I think when it comes to hip hop, I think hip hop is at its best and the strongest when we're community based. When it's communal, so you know it ain't one one person above the community. You know. Mm -hmm. I feel that. I feel that. So how did you get in the game? Like, uh, you know, like like your story from you starting off as a DJ and working behind. <laughs> Yeah. So how did you get started? Well, the, the DJ thing was short-lived. I, I just wasn't good at that. I, I had to hang I that that. <laughs> But uh, You know, it just, I mean, I, I think it just came from, from growing up in Brooklyn, growing up in New York, especially in the era of where, where hip-hop is, is just being birthed and, and, and grooming and, and, and booming and going. So I was always into hip hop it just wasn't I mean, what else are you going to be into like there was no choices like it was just all around us so it was just fully immersed you know um and so yeah during my high school years i did everything from djing to i, I used to be in rap battles um you know cop an uh, mpc with my friends and we started learning how to produce and taught ourselves how to make beats and and just finding our passions and and for me it was always lyricism really that stood out in the MC portion of it. And so, you know, I was doing that in and around New York City, going to battles, open mics, all of that. And, and you know, I, I got an opportunity some years later from, from a friend of mine named Tim Hotep, a really close friend of mine, was working at Complex, and he gave me an opportunity to write an album review. Mm. And I was getting paid for it. So, you know, it wasn't the rap wasn't bringing no bread really like that. So I said, yo, let me try it. And, you know, one album review led to two, you know, a, a write-up in Complex turned to a write-up in The Source, then XXL, then Vibe, and I just kept building until I was able to amass a resume for myself. And, I, you know, it was just building blocks from there. Yeah. I feel that, man, because I remember back in my college days, like, writing, like, rap reviews and just hoping to maybe, you know, like, get on a blog or something like that, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, I remember, like, The Source 5 mics, like, I always wanted to try to not not necessarily recreate it but have something that's just as important within the game you know what i'm saying because the because the whole five mics thing was a big thing like you had to get on that list and you wanted to get as close to five mics as possible 
Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it was an amazing time with the Source was able to do those, that five mic, and you're right. I think a lot of people try to recreate their own version of that. Yeah. Um, you know, also the hip hop quotable, the verse of the month. Like there was just certain staples that that we really looked towards, and and a lot of that was because we came up in the time when the Source was one of the few yes. magazines and one of the few places where hip hop was being documented, where it felt real and authentic. There weren't that many. And now, now there's so many different avenues that you can go down. Um, you know, it, it's a little harder to stand out, man. But yeah, those source days meant everything. Yeah, I feel you. So, so you did the album reviews, and then you transitioned to MTV. Now, I, so I was doing album reviews as a freelancer, and then from there, I started doing artist interviews and profiles. And I'm, I'm a freelancer at this point. I'm working in the mailroom. Yeah somewhere not even related to music and I'm doing my freelance thing and for a couple of years I, I just built up clips I built up a bunch of writing samples and was able to land a job at um Scratch Magazine as their yep. senior editor it was a full-time job at Scratch Magazine I was nice. there for about three months shout out to my man Brendan Frederick who actually um is the chief content officer over at Genius now he had hired me at Scratch three months later the magazine folded um, and I'm out of a job and, you know, I just toiled around for three months and then I got the call to, to come work at double XL. So I did double XL for a number of years and then, um, transitioned to MTV after about four years of double XL. Okay. Okay. So you've always been on the journalistic side of things in the game. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, absolutely. so do you think that the way that, um, artists and albums are reported on do you think that that has changed now like do you think it's like because like back in the day like like i think it was more so like it was more so journalistic integrity at some point but now i see like more just clickbait type shit you know yeah I mean? well yeah it changed completely because first of all you got to look at the format in which we receive it changed yeah. before it was a magazine it was this tangible thing now it's on the internet yeah. Um, a lot of things led to that, you know, um, it costs money to make a magazine. Just the price of paper costs money. Distribution costs money. To fill those pages with different writers costs money. So it wasn't like anybody could just start a magazine. You didn't needed a certain amount of capital. And then to really be respected, you needed a certain amount of respect within the culture, which those early guys had. That Vibe, you know, Vibe was started by Quincy Jones. You know what I'm saying? Like, it don't get no more respected than Quincy Jones or, you know, Benzino and Dave Mays. They definitely had they, they swag within the culture. Mm. When you get to the internet era, anybody can start a website. It's not super expensive. Anybody can start a Twitter handle. Anybody. So the ways in which hip-hop are being reported now are so vast. Yeah. And then, honestly, you, you don't know who's behind those Twitter handles. A lot, a lot. Listen, man, a lot of these sites, a lot of these people buying for our attention online, these Twitter, these social handles that are reporting on hip hop don't look like us. Yeah. They don't come from where we come from. Now in the magazine too, it was like that too, but ownership not necessarily looking like us too. That's not a new phenomenon. But what I'm saying is now anybody could do it and you don't know what that person's resume is. You don't know where they come from. You don't know. And the name of the game is just to get you to click. How many times you click the story and then it was trash. Like the right. writing was trash, it was spelling errors, but they already got the click. It don't matter. Yeah, or they just copied and pasted the shit. Yeah, it's it, so it's definitely like a lot more. But you know, that's just media in general, and that's just what what the internet does. It is great because it democratized a lot of things and it broke down a lot of walls. Yeah. And the downside of it is you have a lot of bullshit. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So along with being VP of Artist Relations for Genius, um, you also uh, coordinate the uh, interview series on the record. Like, you also host that. Yeah, for the record, yeah, I, I host that. Um, um, and, you know, I do a lot of stuff behind the scenes, too. I manage a team of, um, of our Artist Relations Department. So because we book – if you look at Genius and you kind of just look at our YouTube page alone, yeah. You know, Verify, which is the series on the yellow background, we do five of those a yeah. week. We do one every day. We do Deconstructed. We have so many series. I, You know, I believe that we create more artists, more opportunities for artists to shine light on artists than any other publisher. 
So there's a lot of booking. So I got a whole team that, that works with me on booking and we have a whole video team. So it's just a lot of coordination of setting up shoots. And then once we have the shoot set up, like really um, doing the research to ask the right questions and, and things like that. But yeah, for the record, it, it, it's my show where, where you'll see my face, where it's front facing. And, and I work on that with um, Rahel, who's amazing, amazing producer. And, you know, it's a team effort, though. Mm -hmm. and, and you've done a lot of great interviews on, uh, for the record, uh, interview with Wiz, uh, Jadakiss, um, more big names. But who was, who was your most favorite interview on For the Record? On For the Record, my most famous interview, um, I really love the interview I did with Pusha T right after, um, right when he dropped Daytona. Uh. That was, that was a dope interview. Um, what else? I'm trying to think. Future, you know what I'm saying? I had, I had a great Future interview where, you know, it was it, – because Future don't open up that much, and he really opened up about him and, and his struggles with lean and, yeah. and how he uses that and represents himself. Um, I, I really loved the – the I did an interview with Billie Eilish that I think was, was, was really dope. Like, I think she's super talented. Rap City, Royce the 5'9". That's just a few. Mm -hmm. It's hard to pick one. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. So, like, not only are you a journalist, um, I, I keep saying it, but you're also an artist as well. Um, so, like, is like you doing music? Is that something that you just pick up every now and then? And nah, then nah, yeah. man, I'm I'm ten toes down. I I got both feet in the pool. Like, I all the way jumped in to the <laughs> music thing. It was something that I always did. Like I explained to you, I, I always yeah was on to the MC MC inside of things. It got hard to do when my journalism career picked up because it just looked and felt weird to a lot of people, you know. But while I was working at Double XL, I had music on blogs. I had music on Two Dope Boys and Now Right and on Smash. And it got to a point where I was forced to choose um, out of the journalism career of the music. And I, I, I chose – I love them both. It wasn't like I was using journalism to, to get my MC shit off. Like, I respect the culture too much. Yeah kind of angle and, and play the game that way if i get the mc shit pop when it pop it got to pop off of my own merit and off the strength of me so um i had to choose and i you know i chose the 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 career the money because you know i got kids to feed and stuff like that and i, I loved it but then you know once i got and built my journalism career up to a point where it was like you couldn't even question it but i think people knew what i was about and knew what i was in it for I just started putting out music again. So um I've been I've been putting out music consistently since two thousand seventeen. Facts, facts. And I can understand what you say about like people not being as receptive to it as, as you would think, just because like a lot of people do try to use the game to try to to try to get on in their own way. But a lot of people don't really understand, especially being a journalist, you gotta have multiple hustles. You can't just have the journalist check. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> nah, you know, it's Look, if you look at it now, look, it's more competition than that. Like, you know, everybody, um, Joe Budden is out there making content. Nori's making content. Fat Joe got everybody and their mother on, on his Instagram. Joe so, Bro. yeah, man. So, so it, go, it goes both ways. And, 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 you know, look, man, if I'm trying to get an interview and Fat Joe's trying to get an interview, yeah. you know, they might go to Joe because they have, you know, more of a, a rapport with him as, as an MC. But I don't even trip off of that. Honestly, I don't even think I know I'm great at what I do on the interview tip. I know I'm I'm great at what I do on on the music tip, and it really just stems from just having the love for for both of them, you know. Yeah. And 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 I could do multiple things within the day, and hopefully, if anything, I, I hope that's what the audience sees, is that they you know like yo, man, it's 2020. You can't just be boxed into one thing. Um, so you know, just do what you love. Yeah, amen, amen. And the thing about it, like you brought up Joe and Nori and Joe Button, but the, but they were artists first. You know what I'm right. saying? Like they have run at, as being artists, whereas with you, you're doing both. But the thing is that though, like you can relate to artists on different level, on different levels. You know what I'm saying? Like you can relate to them from a journalist, and you and you have that journalistic integrity. So the interview is going to go the right way, and you know what questions to ask. But you also know that side from being an artist. So you know the struggle, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. And process it was, of it. Yeah, it was funny because in a lot of my interviews, 
you could even see it. Like a lot of artists that I would interview knew that I I, I rap too. Like yeah. I, some shit that they saw, they just picked up on. And and early on in my career, Dayton Thomas used to be the editor in chief for Double XL. He's now the head of Vibe Magazine. He had told me he was like, "Yo, your interviews are good because you know what it's like to create. You know the process. You might not have the success of the people that you're interviewing, but you know what it's like to 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 put your shit on the line for for your art." And he was like, man, that's why your interviews are so good. And then it's funny. If people go back and watch certain interviews, like I did a big one when I was at MTV in 2015 with, with Kendrick Lamar for To Pimp a Butterfly. Okay. And, and, and Kendrick said, like, nobody picked up on it because nobody knew. But Kendrick was like, we were talking about wordplay or something like that, a, a specific wordplay that he used. And he was like, yeah, you know all about that. Like, that's what you do. Da, 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 da. So it was like, it's funny looking back on it, like the clues was always there, but the people, the audience didn't know it. Okay. I feel that. I feel that. So like, like you, um, just to talk about your MTV days real quick, like you was behind the scenes working at MTV, right? Uh, a little bit of both. I, I did whatever needed to be done. So, you know, I, I worked alongside Sway. So a lot of what I was doing, I was writing on the site. When I was at MTV, I was doing like five, six, seven articles a day on their mm. website. I was only required to do four. When they mm. came in, they said, we need you to write four articles a day, four news articles, not blog posts, but reports. And when mm. I got in there, I made a name for myself. They needed me to do four. I was doing seven. By lunchtime, I had five or four stories. And um, so, and I was working very close with Sway and a guy named Ramon Dukes. We had a show called Rat Fix Live. So a lot of what I was doing behind the scenes before I even got on camera was I was helping them prep for Rat Fix Live. So if it was doing the research, you know, helping Sway come up with the questions, just, just you know, being, again, like I never told nobody that's not my job. You know what I'm saying? And um, one day Sway had came to me and said, yo, you going to get a chance to be on camera. He said, I can't tell you how. I can't tell you when, just be ready. And he said, uh -huh. when that camera go on, he said, don't change who you are, exactly who you are behind the scenes. Be that same way in front of the camera. That shit's going to translate. And, you know, he gave me that opportunity. I got that opportunity. And, and, and you know, so a, a lot of what I did in MTV was behind the scenes, but I did a lot of stuff in front of the camera as well. So did you bomb your first time on camera? Oh, it was terrible. It was <laughs> terrible. The, fir the first time on camera at MTV... I interviewed Lil B. Oh, okay. Um, and everybody, it was funny, man, and God bless Sway. Everybody after came to me, all my peoples, all my friends, even my coworkers at the time, yo, you killed it. Yo, that was so great. Like, they was gassing, they was bigging me up. Yeah. Two days after the interview came out, Sway, Sway came up to me. He said, okay. He said, you feel good? I was like, I, I feel good. He was like, okay, you got all that praise and stuff? I was like, yeah, man, it feel good. He said, okay, now I'm going to tell you everything that you did wrong. Mm. And so Sway let, let me bask in glory for those two days. And then he was like, all right, it's time to get to work. Your, your, your body, your posture was ridic was bad. You were slumped in the couch. You, you, he just started your body language. The energy was low. He started listing everything that I did wrong. And that was the realest shit ever for me. I, I think, you know, I, I could see a world where somebody might be offended by that because I was getting criticized. Yeah. Now, I took that all in. I said, oh, he cares. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that my friends didn't care about me, but Sway is, is that's the guy when it comes to yeah. on-camera interviews and hip-hop. So if anybody know, he know. So he's seeing it at a different level. He's seeing my potential and he's seeing what I was doing. So the first time was terrible and, and Sway pulled me to the side after two days. He ain't bust my bubble right away two days and then he, he just gave me notes and we went to work and I just I just kept on improving from there. Man, I feel that man. I understand that moment man. I had the same moment with Big Tigger at one point. He he pulled me to the side like you know you may be filling in on my show one day. And the first time I did it, I couldn't even get through the intro. I was just stumbling over the words and shit, man. So like that first time like you always go through it man, but it's needed. It's needed. Yeah. And, and, and then you need that big homie love to pull you to the side after after you feeling good for yourself. But okay, I want you to keep doing this shit. So let me tell you what you did wrong. Yeah, that that's a true OG man, and 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 you gonna run into just old heads who are just bitter and yeah. just try to hold you down because you're younger. And then you are gonna run into OGs who right. really give you that game. 
and, and you just got to recognize who is who, man. But, you know, guys like Tigger, guys like Sway, like, come on, man. Like, Angie Martinez is somebody else who I, who I put in that category. Like, you know, just blessed to kind of be around these people and, and pick up game. It's only going to make us better. And then it's our duty when we get to where we're going is to, is to hand that down and to give that game to, to somebody younger than us. Yeah, absolutely, 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 definitely. But now we done talked about the journalism side. Let's go ahead and get to this music. So um, a lot of people don't know how this interview came about. Um, you just dropped the record, uh, Easy Money Sniper. And uh, I seen it on, on Smash. And I was like, damn, man, this shit hard. Like, I fuck with this shit. And like for me, I just love to post shit that I rock with. You know what I'm saying? So I saw it, I posted it. And he actually hit me back. I was like, damn, man, Rob Markman. And like, I, had, I had to go through a little fanned out stage for a little second because, but like, you got to understand, I, I remember reading your articles when I was in college. You know what I'm saying? All right. so, and, and, and a lot of the things that you've done, I'm trying to do, you know what I'm saying? And like, for you to reach out to me was just a blessing. But this new record, Easy Money Sniper, man, you got to tell the people about it. We was playing it earlier before you checked in. Wow, yeah. Now nah, that's dope. And first of all, thank you for the post. And, and and my shit is is I know who I am as a journalist and, and you know, I, as as an artist, nobody has to post my music. You ain't have to put that on your gram. Uh -huh. Like I'm thankful for that. Like you ain't have to share that with the people who you you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So so of course I'm gonna reach out. But honestly, I feel the same way about my interview. So if you would have posted an interview of mine, I'd have hit you back too, most likely, like if I could have got to it. For sure, but you know, I you know, I, I'm grateful for things like that. But um the Easy Money Sniper record, man, from the second I heard the beat, my man Devious Mind sent it to me. I, I put it on my IG and my stories. I remember I pulled up the beat. As soon as I I'm playing it, I'm like, oh, I'm keeping this. Like within as soon as the drums dropped, I knew what it was. I said, Oh, I'm keeping this. And I just started writing right away. And you know, that record, Easy Money Sniper is obviously a reference to Kevin Durant. You know, that's his yes. IG handle. But, you know, it's just a metaphor. Like, you know, easy money sniper, bitch, I'm calling my shot. It's Back. really just about taking your destiny into your own hands, um, wanting the ball in the fourth quarter in those clutch moments because you have this belief in yourself. So it was inspired by that and kind of the things that we see KD do on the court, especially when people was doubting him. Mm. But, you know, I, I just turned it into my story about music, about, you know, it, it, you know, when, when I transitioned into music, there was a lot of doubt. There was a lot of snickering. There was a lot of behind my back talking, a lot of laughing. Who do who do you think he is? Da, 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 da. And it's like, nah, I, I'm just going to – I'd rather bet on me. i take that last shot. If I'm brick, i brick. But if I make it, i make it. And I believe in myself. I'm going to make it. So that's what the song was really about. It, it was like telling my story, but I wanted to motivate people as well. And then I got my man Doe Man on, on, on the second verse just to – bring it on home. Yes, and like, talk about betting on yourself because a lot of us millennials, we hear that and we like see the stories of people who have bet on themselves, but the actual process of like taking the future in your own hands when you were basically trained to be a worker almost because, you know, you go to college, they say, you know, get you a job, get you a good job and all of that. So like, talk about taking your future in your own hands, especially in this type of industry. That's funny because I, I learned that from millennials, I guess. I, I learned that from people younger than me. Actually, I learned that from, look, man, a lot of artists that are the world's favorite artists right now, I was interviewing them, if not the first, like early, before most people were paying attention. And it was just purely based off of talent. And this is the real, and they'll tell you, I mean, I'm talking the Kendricks, I'm talking the Mac Millers, I'm talking the Wiz Khalifas, I'm talking the J. Coles, like the biggest in the game, rest in peace, Mac Miller. Um... Big Sean, like, I was interviewing these guys early before most people were, and it was strictly off of their talent. Like, I just fucked with their talent, and then they became the biggest artists in the world. So it, it was like, well, why can't I? Like, I, 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 I've been seeing so many people take it from the bottom to the top. It's possible. And then for me, it's just having that belief, like, if, some, if it's possible, it's possible. Like, whether you make it or not, like, it's not impossible. You know what I'm saying? I kind of liken it like this little anecdote. I remember when I took my driver's test for the first time, I failed. So I was feeling like shit, like, God damn, I failed the driver's test. I ain't shit. And then I'm walking down the street. We in New York, so it's, it's, a, it's a thousand cars on, on, on the street. 
and I, I look I look in the street and I'm like, man, all these people driving, they got their driver's license. I, I don't. All these motherfuckers not better than me. There's some dumbass out there who passed the driver's test and they figured it out. If they mm -hmm. could do it, I could do it. And mm -hmm. every time I think about that and I apply it to myself, you know how many fucking terrible ass rappers they are? Facts. Like, I'm like, if, if, if such, such could do it, I could do it. And there's a lot of them that I interview. Like, I, I had a line about that, like, I'm be interviewing rappers that I'm better than. Like it's, <laughs> like, it's a fact. Like, I'll just be there across the table. Like, man, I can do this. Like, are you crazy? So. Anybody ever mention that line to you? Nah. I, I saw a couple <laughs> people like LOL about it. But nah, I, you know, I, I don't think the song took off that big. So it might have hit the radar. But I don't care. Like, you know, it's the truth. Plus, you're supposed to have that belief in yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got to shoot your shot. And along with the Easy Money Sniper, you had something tucked away in the stash that I just stumbled upon on YouTube, uh, Play in the Rain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Play in the Rain. A lot of personal relationships. Yeah. So so what all this is, is um, all this year, last year I released an album called It's Too Late at the Wake. Yeah. And, and that was great. But the album is just a moment, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying, that I could share. That came out in May. So I, I said this year what I'm going to do, I'm still dropping the album this year, but I, I made a commitment to myself last year. I said, I'm just going to drop singles all throughout the year on the 1st and the 15th of every month. So I've been dropping songs on the 1st and 15th of every month all oh. this year to build consistency, to build catalog, and it really keeps me sharp. Like, you know what I'm saying? The rapping is only going to get better through repetition. So the more I do it, mm -hmm. we just going up levels. And, and so... Play, Play in the Rain was a song that I dropped right before Easy Money Sniper. And that one was personal about um about a friendship that I had that um and the person had passed. And and it's really just he and I took two different lanes. You know, yeah. like we both grew up in the hood. Um we both had the same influences around us. I kinda went the school route, the route, and he went the street route. I I thought that eventually I could get so successful that I could come pull him back so he didn't have to do the illegal stuff anymore. I, I just didn't get successful enough in time to be able to really employ somebody and and he ran out of time and lost his life. So, you know, mm -hmm. it was just kind of an ode to, to him. Um, but And, you know, a bit of survivor's remorse, you know. Yeah. Like, why me and not him, you know? Yeah, we all have that in this game, definitely, man. So, so like you, you're consistently dropping the music um, on on the first and the fifteenth. Um, is that a marketing strategy? You know, yeah, what I'm saying? I, I guess you know you got to keep it interesting. Like yeah, yeah like it, it's funny because when you say marketing strategy, it really sounds like you selling something to people. It always sounds like disingenuous, but yeah, nah, it's a marketing strategy. One, the first thing is consistency. So yeah. I had to I had to pick a schedule. Mm. And, and, and for me, the 1st and 15th, just growing up, those were two important days because that's when that was payday, you know, especially yeah. when you was relying on public assistance or the checks yeah. to come mm. through. The government checks came on the 1st and the 15th, and a lot of times that's when the hood ate. So the 1st yeah. and the 15th come through, and, and if you was in the street, that's when smokers were spending their money. You know, Facts. if you was in hair, that's when girls got their they, they hair done. You know what I'm saying? So the first and the fifteenth is when the money starts circulating through the hood. So I picked those two days for that reason, and 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 looked at the music as an investment in myself. So for every first and fifteenth, I'm a, I'm gonna pay myself. I feel that now the streets is eating up Rob Martin. <laughs> Word. Yes, Word. yes. Before we go, um, I gotta ask you, like, what's your what's your outlook on the game right now? On the in terms of, of? It, on the state of hip hop. But like in general? Yeah, in general. That's a big question. Mm. I, I mean, I think the game is bigger than, than it's ever been. And um I, I I I'm just looking for balance. I think I think what we what we lack is balance in this digital era mm -hmm. where everything now everybody's trying to fit into an algorithm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and everybody's sound is the same because we're trying to trick these computers to play us more or to move us at the top of the playlist. Or to, you know what I'm saying, surface it. Like, you even look on your Instagram, you don't get your feed. It's not in the order that people post it that you follow. It's an album. Mm -hmm. Instagram fucks with yeah. 
order in which you see things and the same things happen on these streaming services. Um, you know, it, it, but it was like that too. Like when in the radio era, you know, when radio was huge, then people follow a radio formula and the radio hits. So it's always follow the leader. So to me, I think there's a lot more of that now because the technology allows there to be more artists than ever. So, uh, you know, you just got to be careful of the algorithms, man, because they'll change the algorithm and yeah. your whole style will be fucking dismantled because you was following the computer and somebody changed the program and then you at the bottom of the list. Um, with that said, I, I think we have more artists now also being as creative as ever. So that's the thing that I'm into. I'm, I'm into the creativity. What sets you apart? You know, yeah. I, I don't need you to sound like this one or that one. Like, what sets you apart? Um so it's, it's good and it's bad, man. But don't let this technology fool you, man. Like, at the end of the day, you can't. You, you even got shit like deep fakes now where people are making fake Travis Scott's and Jay-Z songs using computer programs and shit like yeah. that. I don't know if you've seen this. Like, man, we that shit is all bullshit, man. Like, the music is always going to come from the heart, man. Like, you can't ever replace that. I feel you. I feel you. Uh, and uh, one more question. Uh, you being in New York, uh, what's your thoughts on Takashi? Now that he's off house arrest, <laughs> I don't even talk about him, man. Like, I, you know, it's a distraction. Yes, to me, like I, I don't, I don't think what they say, and and, and me, you know, all, all skin folk ain't can folk. You know what I'm saying? And, and him being Latino, and him being from New York, and and. You know, for us, like being Latino in New York and being black, there's co mingling. We share culture. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Um, but I don't think he was ever part of us. It, if the way if the way that, that you hear him speak about hip hop and how he writes his rhymes and it, it was never it never I never heard him speak genuinely about the art form. You know what I'm saying? Um he, he had done said things where I think he was talking about one song. He was telling Angie Martinez, oh, I came up with that in two minutes. It's so simple. I know rappers are mad, like, who spend all these time writing rhymes. Like, it was never about the art form for him, right? Okay. He's not the only one. There's a lot of people in hip-hop like that, but it's never about the art form. And then when you talk about the street aspect of it, okay, it was never about the streets neither. It was never about a code that you live by either because you turn on that quickly. So it's like, what do you stand for? And to me, it kind of looks like he stands for himself. He's out for himself. So, you know, what I said at the beginning of this thing, this thing is about community base. And, you know, I judge you more on who, not what you could do, not how much you could sell, but who can you uplift? Who can you bring with you? What opportunities can you create for people? I don't see any of that going on with him. So for me, it's out of sight, out of mind. Like, I don't pay no attention to it because the attention that we pay for it and all these hip-hop sites and everybody – posting his every move. Y'all keep feeding it. I keep giving it attention. But y'all also tell me y'all don't care about it. Or y'all also tell me you're against it. So it, it can't be both. Like, for me, he ain't, he ain't one of us. The thing that I represent, he don't represent, so it don't matter to me. I feel you. I feel you. And I like what you said about, you know what I'm saying, him just being out for self because being in Atlanta, I see that a lot in media. You know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of people want to be on radio or want to be media hosts just so they can make themselves big. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't love the music. They like they don't even listen to the to these artists that they try to interview. They don't even, like, they can't quote no lyric. They can't tell them about a record that's their favorite on the, on the track. Nothing. Yeah. That, 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 that's the part that I hate the most, man. I, I don't care who it is. And I've, I've interviewed them all. And I, I, I interview damn near more artists than anybody or just as much as, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I listen to everything. If I sit down with you, I'm going to listen to, to your project. Thanks. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I owe it to the craft of this. Like, this this ain't about me. This is about, like, it's about telling your story. So how can I bring that story out of you the best way? You know, um, I hate selfish people, man. I'm not I'm not for it. So anybody who, who you got to look out for you. You got to put me first. You got to take care of yourself because nobody's going to take care of you. Facts. Once we put that off the table, though, I can't stand a selfish person, man. Like, like, and, and we see that. We see that in media. A lot of people are just faces. Like, you just yeah. a pretty face, or or you just look good, or you just want the light. But it's like, what are you really doing? Uh -huh. What are you really giving? You know what I'm saying? Um, 
and we got to weed those people out. Cause yeah. like, like I said, hip hop was always based off of community. And this shit is the best when we're communal and we're helping each other. That's how we get those movements. That's how we got the Rockefeller movement. It wasn't just Jay. It was like, look at everybody who came up and was spawned up out of that. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, look at look at Dungeon Family and Outkast and them, the A and, and Jermaine Dupri and how that creates opportunity for other people. Like you see, I love what Atlanta is doing because it, it feels like an Atlanta artist, there's definitely issues in Atlanta between artists and, and, and whatever, right? But more often than not, they're helping each other. More mm -hmm. often than not, like two chains will get on a song with the guy that Atlanta knows, but maybe the rest of the world hadn't heard. Like it is it, it, more putting the ego to the side yeah. than it is about just me, me, me. Like, and you know, I think we could all embody a bit of that. Yeah, I feel that. Amen, man. But again, Rob Martin. Thank you for tapping in with me. Make sure y'all check out Genius, Genius Lyrics. Um, for the record, if you do not watch those interviews, you miss it. Now, I watch them shits all the time, man. I appreciate you. You have no you have no idea how much that means to me. Just somebody who I've seen, like, when I was in college, dreaming of doing the things that I'm doing today, I was reading your material. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're one of the journalists I knew from back in the day, man. And that's that's dope. We tapped in now. Like, that. that's it. And, you know, it's all about, like, just supporting each other, man. Because I, if you ain't read those articles, if you ain't click those articles or buy those magazines, or then my career wouldn't have went. Yeah. It went, man. So it, it's just like, man, supporting you and what you do. I, I'm thankful for your platform. You know what I'm saying? I usually do the interviewing. Yeah. <laughs> Still a little weird to be on this side for me. But I'm thankful for it. And then, you know, as you get go up in your careers just finding somebody to give a little game to and pull up along with you man and that's it yeah, yeah shout out to new face too new face man what up that my man has the illest collection of all hip-hop memorabilia like he could start his own museum um you know what I'm saying just based <laughs> off of his collection a shout out to new face shout out to whole vein for checking in too as well i seen you whole vein already man rob markman thank you write the dream already uh easy money sniper y'all make sure y'all go check that out make sure y'all follow my guy he got a new project jumping on um when are you planning on dropping the project we definitely put i ain't good of a date out but it's definitely coming this year we definitely i'm dropping the full album this year um i'm super active like trust me but the album's coming this year man before the year's out all right man you already know man 2020 been breezing by dog so i know be on the gotta stay tapped in Love, peace, man. Love uh, already, man. Thank you, bro. Yes, sir. Up to my guy, Rob Markman. Easy Money Sniper, y'all heard it. I'm about to play it again and again and again. I got do. And uh, appreciate everybody for tuning in, man. Another edition of Plug, man, of course. Got to keep these interviews going. And uh, it's crazy again. I, I said I was going to get these interviews started back up again. The next day, I heard from Rob Markman. That's a sign. All right, somebody who loves the game as much as me. Easy Money Sniper. Y'all go check that out. All right, keep it locked. I keep it lit.